Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And yes, I am so happy that you're here today because God's word is going to nourish you. It's going to build you up, which will empower you to do all that God has called you to do and very importantly, to become the person that God wants you to become. Praise God. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and go today to Mark chapter 12. We're going to receive the holy tithes and offerings. Before we jump into today's message, let's drop down to verse 13. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true. And care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You know, they might as well have skipped all of the false flattery because uh, they're, they're going for the kill. They might as well just gone ahead and just popped the question. They just should have said, uh, Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But they try to frame it in their uh, setup of their verbiage, but the Lord sees through it. But still, the question remains. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Some people still marvel today from the perspective that they, they have no problem paying Caesar. In other words, they'll pay their taxes. Now, of course, many do it grumbling and mumbling, uh, especially as taxes now are very, very high. There are some nations that half of your paycheck is gone. The moment you earn it, they've taken half of it. I have ministered in one nation, a particular nation in Europe, and I know for a fact that the tax rate's right around 55%. So they are taking over half of the money that you've earned. Now, somebody might say, well, Pastor Stephen, those nations give you extra perks and benefits. Uh, not, not really. <laughs> Not, not really. Uh, if you could keep your money for yourself. Now, I know that we need to pay you some, some taxes so that we have good roads. We have a defense system so that, uh, you know, our country is healthy. But when the country is stable and running on good principles, then you don't have to gouge people. You could have a flat tax rate. Let's say it's 8 or 10%. And it's more than enough to get every bridge rebuilt. It's more than enough to have brand new roads. So what we have today is just all kinds of waste. So even if they were the tax 90%, it's still for them it's never enough because there is so much waste and uh, fraudulent uh, oversight. But nevertheless, my friends, it is what it is. And so we still render to Caesar, or in our case here in America, the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, which is the federal arm of tax collection, as well as the state arm here in North Carolina. And so you pay your taxes. And you just pay it, of course, by faith and trust God that what you have left, of course, you're able to, uh, uh, you know, work with and uh, make the best of it, praise God, and that you can still uh, rise to the top, uh, even still. And, of course, you can. But, my friends, while some gladly pay their taxes, yet when it comes to the tithe, many believers suddenly don't want to give God what belongs to him. So Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Well, the tithe, according to Scripture, belongs to God. And remember, God receiving the tithe, God saying that the tenth belongs to me. That's what a tithe is. I, I'm not wearing a tithe today, but I'm talking about the tithe, T-I-T-H-E. And so I know that uh, many don't even know what the tithe is because I can take my 
the latest, uh, you know, iPhone here, and I could speak into it. I could speak into the different uh, search engines, and I could speak into, you know, notepads and stuff like that. And I could say, uh, the Lord is talking about the tithe, and it never, ever spells it right because they don't know what the tithe is. But my friends, as believers, God says the tithe belongs to Him, 10%. And so just as we pay the government, we also need to pay the Lord what belongs to him, which is 10%. As we pay and honor the Lord by bringing the tithe to him, which rightfully he, he says that that part is mine. Bring it, bring it into the storehouse. Let us understand that God's requiring that not for his benefit. You, you do understand that God's not poor, that God is not sending out the angels on a intergalactic hunt for them to find, uh, you know, a pizza restaurant somewhere else besides the planet earth. No, God's not hungry. God has all of his needs met and the realm in which he lives. The heavenly realm is the realm of wealth beyond comprehension. And of course here on the earth, God's the one that designed and created the earth to have all of these, uh, you know, precious metals, whether it's gold, silver, uh, platinum, palladium, whatever it might be. God's the one that put all of that into this planet and as well as many other planets as well. So my friends, God is requiring the tithe, not for his benefit. He, he is requiring the tithe. Yes, because it belongs to him, but through our act of obedience and the exercising of our faith to honor the Lord with what belongs to him, then it empowers us to step into financial covenant with God, which does several things. Number one, it secures our protection. And there's many uh, uncertainties in the world today because the world, in many ways, you have markets, you have economics, they're driven by fear. And what happens in, in China, as we have seen, can affect the U.S. market. What happens in Europe or some other part of the world can affect the U.S. market because now they're all intertwined. But my friends, the tithe is not for God's protection. There's no harm in heaven. There's a wall around the vast complex of heaven. Uh, and there are these mighty angels that guard it and there's the gates and so forth. So God's, God's, uh, God's place is a place of utter protection. The tithe is to secure your protection. God doesn't need prosperity. He already has it. The tithe is to secure your financial living. So by tithing, God is allowing us the privilege of being able to partner with him in the expansion of his eternal kingdom. And let me tell you something before this is all wrapped up and the Lord takes the church home with him. You'll see the church step out on top, having revealed the multifaceted wisdom of Christ to the principalities and powers that they say you have to cheat and you have to do dirty stuff to get ahead. But the church will display the multifaceted wisdom of God, that God is a covenant keeping God. And if you walk with him, he'll take you to the top. And before the church wraps things up and the Lord takes the church home, you're going to see the church dominating in many, many areas of uh, everything from economics to agriculture to even these other areas of banking and so forth and education. Watch what the Lord is going to do because there will come a time where even strong nations and their leaders will say, we don't have answers to this. And you know what? They won't, but they'll see the church shining like a city on the hill. And they'll say, how are they doing so good in the midst of all of this craziness? Wow. And so you're going to see churches get stronger and stronger and stronger. Watch. And when I say there's, of course, there's only one church, but it's just like the nation of Israel made up of 12 tribes. You're going to see the tribes getting empowered and stronger and stronger. And before the Lord comes back, you'll see that when the church exits, the church will exit on top as a witness as a witness, not only to the world, but to the principalities and powers that God's eternal wisdom is the highest wisdom of all. Now let's walk in that wisdom and honor the Lord with what he requests, which is his tithe. Let's bring the tithe into the storehouse, 10% of all of our increase. And of course, as well, we can sow seed or give an offering on top of that. Your tithe is not an offering. The tithe belongs to the Lord. The, an offering is above and beyond anything that 
would be beyond the tithe. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those of you that are mailing in your tithe, please send it to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina, our zip code 28654. Now, for those of you that prefer to go online and bring the tithe in in a way that's very safe and secure, and you can do it from anywhere in the world, please visit our ministry website, stephenbrooks.org. There's a link on the homepage that says give. It has a red heart. Click that, and you'll see the, the online giving portal where you can bring the tithe in safe and secure. Now, if you would also like to sow some financial seed, because you're going to apply kingdom principles, and these all originate from God's laws of agriculture, of sowing seed, reaping harvest. If you would like to sow financial seed, you can see also an orange banner that says projects. You can click on that and see the three projects that we are most focused on at this time, and your gifts are greatly appreciated as we continue to expand God's kingdom, hallelujah, and represent the glory, the goodness, the love, and the wisdom of of Christ. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I'm praying for your people right now, the tithers, the givers. We thank you, Father, because without tithers, there would be no churches. Without tithers, there would be no special works of your, uh, of you, O oh God, going on in the earth. So we thank you, Father God, that we have the privilege of coming into a financial covenant with you through tithing, and thus we can be protected and safe. In a world where there's many changing dynamics. And we thank you, Father God, that we don't have to be on the roller coaster ride that the world uh, goes through with fear and panic and pandemonium, and then maybe a little bit of stability, and then just repeat that whole process over and over. Lord, we thank you that we have protection in you and that you rebuked the devourer on behalf of the tithers. Now, Father, we thank you. Bless your people. We thank you, Father God, for the windows of heaven being opened and the rain coming down. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for your precious giving. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Lord is blessing you. Praise God. Amen. Let's take our Bibles today, and I want us to go to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. And I want to talk about uh, a certain position. We could even call it a stance. And let's call it the four-point stance, okay? Four points in this stance or in this position that will set you up so that God steps in. Now, I believe that you would understand and agree with me that anytime God comes on the scene, it's over for the devil. It's over for the sickness. It's over for the problem. Why? A more powerful source, a more powerful strength or entity has now come on the scene. That's what happens when God steps in. And God does want to step into your life. But I believe that there's, there's ways that we need to position ourselves. And let's talk about that today. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 15. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, as we jump into your word. Father, let your word be alive today. We thank you. This, this is a living book and let it be quickened by your Holy Spirit so that we can take it and run with it and be positioned. And Father, we thank you that you're going to move. This is the time where you're moving. You, you are showing your power and we praise you for it. We thank you in Jesus name. We pray. Amen. Second Chronicles. Let's go down to verse 15. Part B of that verse, the latter part of that verse says, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. My friends, don't feel out of order. Don't feel isolated. If you ever feel that you are in a position where you're outnumbered, maybe in a sense outvoted, and there seems to be no way to win, outgunned, outmatched, however you want to say it. If God comes on the scene, it can change immediately. And that's what God loves to do. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle, 
Position yourselves. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Position yourselves. You're going to have to know the position that you're going to take going into these various things where you are, in a sense, going up against the enemy's camp, going up against the powers of darkness to rightly possess and take what God promised you. You have to understand there will be engagements. So you're going to have to have a position. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear, be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, of course, there's other times when they are not instructed to stand still. There's other times there is engagement. So you can't uh, set rules in concrete concerning how the Lord wants to do it. Sometimes, like when the Lord was dealing with David, he would say, now directly go against them. Other times, you know, swing around and outflank them from the, uh, come up from the rear and so forth. So you're going to have to be open to the Holy Spirit. We can't make formulas, although we can certainly follow principles. And one of those principles is that winning faith is based on where you take your stand. It means you take a covenant position and operate your faith from that position. Get ready to get in the right stance today. Now, I want to ask, I want you to ask yourself a question. Where do I stand in order for my faith to produce? I really do believe that today's message will cause some of you to shift into a stance that is very, very productive. Praise God. Well, let's look at a classic verse. First John chapter five, verse four, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now this scripture is basically telling us that faith is an overcoming weapon. So it's important for you and I to locate where we need to stand so that we can use this weapon effectively and thus allow our faith to produce the victory. Mm -mm. Get ready. Get ready. Praise God. Now, let's begin today with a fundamental truth. And this fundamental truth is this. Every time we are confronted and challenged, God has a plan for us to overcome. Now, right off the bat, we may not know exactly what that plan is, but I'm telling you, anytime you run up against something like Jehoshaphat did, being greatly outnumbered, and then the prophecy comes forth and it includes words of wisdom, I'm just telling you, my friends, no matter what you run up against or how impossible it might be, it's good for us to understand that God still has a plan for us to overcome. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Praise God. So today, I want to share four, four, um, I, I would call it a four-point stance that will establish a great stand in your life and cause your faith to produce what it is that you're believing God for, what it is that you're desiring God to do. Praise God. All right, number one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what it is, but when I tell you what it is, uh, please just hold patient, steady for a moment, because what I'm covering today, I'm going to come in from a different angle, and I believe it's going to help some of you make an adjustment in your stance that you need to make. So uh, don't just write off the bat, oh, Pastor Stephen, I've heard that. Get ready. Get ready. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to open this up for, uh, up for you. Number one. Believe in the Lord your God. Oh, Pastor Stephen, that, that's ABCs. I learned that decades ago. Now, hold on just a moment. Look at this in Scripture. Second Chronicles 20. Now, we've already looked at verse 15 and 17. Let's go down to verse 20. So they arose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, now listen to what the king said. Believe in the Lord your God, 
and you shall be what? Messed up? No. And you shall be established. I'm telling you right now, your foundation is more important than you ever, ever knew. Sometimes you have to make a little shift and kind of go back and uh, touch that foundation up a little bit. Okay. Believe in the Lord, your God, and you shall be established. Believe as prophets and you shall prosper. Now, of course, part B is very exciting because everybody wants a prophecy uh, that will give them the, the direction or that sure word. And that, yes, we celebrate. We celebrate that grace. We celebrate that gift. But let's not fly past the first statement that the king made under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Now, here's what we're running into today. I see it often, too often, and I've, I've got to talk a little bit about it. Today, many Christians are loaded with the Word of God. There's teaching all over the Internet. There's, te- there's you know, I, I'm on the Internet there's no telling how many ministers on the internet. I'm on television. There's many other excellent ministers on television. This has caused a great exposure of the Word of God and even teaching of scriptural truths. So today, many Christians are loaded with the Word. Thus, they can confess all types of scriptures that they never knew before, but now because of the plethora of teaching, now They have had exposure to various scriptures and they quote them left and right. And that that's good. But here's what's going on. The scriptures that they're celebrating and quoting and espousing, it's not generating the results of actually what they're proclaiming the scriptures do. And if, if the excited Christian and thank God for the zeal. If the excited Christian could just pull back a little bit and say, now, wait a minute. I know it's true. I do de- declare it and I decree it and all this and that and jump up, down, get all excited about it. But there, there's somewhere around here needs to be some production. There needs to be some production of this. So what's going on? I'm telling you, we're going to dig deeper today. Praise God. What's going on? I'll, I'll tell you what I see the problem as being (sighs) what is going on is that the author of the word, the author of the scriptures, the God who wrote the book is actually in many ways being ignored. Wow. This could be a difficult pill for some of you to swallow. So I'm going to try to make the medicine today just as sweet as possible. So you can get it down. (laughs) Glory to God. Don't go away. Don't go away now just because we're getting to a little bit of a sticking point. Now, I see this particularly this thing of many Christians that can quote scriptures. They can quote them like a machine gun. I see it primarily in charismatic type churches. And I'm just, trust me, I'm just as charismatic as you can be. I see it in, in churches that lean more towards maybe what we would call old style Pentecostal. And trust me, I... I walk in those realms too. I see, but I see it a whole lot. I even see it in Baptist circles where the exposure of the word and all this good teaching, even a lot of uh, precious Baptist folk, uh, they're, they're quoting scriptures or confessing scriptures. And uh, by the way, that's also val- validating that the word of faith message brought years back by Charles Capps and Kenneth Hagin and uh, even modern uh, great men of God, such as Kenneth Copeland that are still plugging away at it. Basically that message won. Why? Because it is, it is spread through the whole body of Christ, which is what God intended for it to do. And it took some, de- some denominations decades and decades for it to finally got in. But it's to a point now where just like the old adage years back, where if it was first said back in the 1950s, God is a good God. It, people, you had Christians, you just get screaming angry and say, don't say that. It's not true. Today, you're a real weirdo in the body of Christ if you think God's bad. Today, it has now been established in the body of Christ because it's present day truth being restored. Today, it's pretty much accepted. It doesn't matter what denomination you're in. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal, Lutheran, or Baptist. You can stand up in church. A preacher can stand behind a pulpit today and say, God is a good God. If you had been a preacher back in the 1950s and said that, somebody could have thrown a songbook at you. Literally. 
literally, because those that broke through in that area, mainly Oral Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, men that were saying God is a good God, they were reproached with venomous attacks. But that truth has prevailed. Now, let's get back on track here. Let me give you an example of how it's possible to quote all these scriptures and be very enthusiastic about the promises of God, uh, but yet it's not actually working. So I, I've seen script, uh, Christians quote scriptures like, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And they get all excited about that. And so they know what is written, yet that word is still not producing. So we're going to have, we're going to have to look at this. Let me give you an example right now that will help us to get some insight into this. Let's say that you need a job and you want a good job. You, um, you're willing to take something so that you can get some income, but at the same time, you don't want to commit and then have to pull out of something. You really would rather get it just right from the go. And let's say that there's a knock on your door one day and you, you really need a job. Okay. You're going to have some bills coming up and you need to get to work quick. There's a knock on your door and uh, you open the door and there's a man standing there in a suit and he says, um, Hey, uh, I just drove by your house and, uh, I want you to know that, um, I work for the big corporation, uh, on the other side of town. And, you know, I just thought I'd knock on your door and see if you need a job. And I want to offer you a job at an executive level position and the pay is this much and you're, you're being offered something exceptional, but you're also thinking now, uh, you're from what company? Oh, I'm from, uh, the so-and-so company. And you're thinking, well, is this guy for real? It's a nice suit he's wearing. And I do, I really do need a job, but is this guy for real? Let's just make it up. Let's say, uh, Ford Motor Company. He's from Ford Motor Company. And he says, we have an executive level position and we want to we want to plug you in. I'm just here to, you know, I, I saw your house and you got your grass mowed real nice. Your car's clean. Seems like you got your act together. Uh, do, you, do you need a job? Well, how do you know he's telling the truth? I mean, maybe he's, maybe he's a total liar. There's, it's, there's a lot of people that can throw a name around. Uh, I come on behalf of so-and-so. Well, do you have anything else besides just, you know, like, uh, you know, like, you're, like a word, so to speak? Well, what if he says, okay, uh, you, you're doubting me. Okay. He says, I'll be back. Give me 30 minutes. He comes back in 30 minutes and he knocks on your door. He says, Hey, I'm back. You open the door. And uh, he says, Hey, this time I've got, I've got paper. Oh, okay. Now this is getting serious. Now why he has paper on the official with the official letterhead. Let's say it's Ford motor company. And, and, and on the paper is is a description that says, uh, this is from Ford and we want you to come work for us and, uh, we'll pay you really good. We can give you uh, stock in the company and we'll do all this other stuff. Okay. And you're thinking, well, yeah, this, this is uh this, this must be for real. Okay. But here's the thing. What if you're still not quite persuaded and he leaves? What if you're not, what if you're not quite persuaded, but one hour later, there's a knock on the door again, and you open the door, and this time, the CEO of Ford is standing there, and he just drove up, let's say, in his Mach-E Mustang, and he says, hey, yep, I'm the CEO. Just want you to know that I got that guy that came out here. Yeah, he's, he's a true representative. You saw him. You saw the paperwork. Now you see me, and what is going on? See, when that authority figure steps in suddenly everything changes everything is different hmm wow the right foundation here's what i want to get across to you the right foundation of faith will actually bring god on the scene praise the lord this is something i want us to dig deeper on concerning this where we are told believe Believe in the Lord your God. And here's why I want to drill this in today. When you really do come into that place of belief, suddenly your doubts are just totally blasted out. They're totally blasted out 
the window. They're gone forever. What if you wanted to work for Tesla and uh, you get a you get a letter in the mail that says, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah we, uh, we like you. Come on down. That, that's all good. That stuff is all good. What if there was a knock on your door and it's Elon Musk? You'd be like, this is crazy. What happened? He, he, why? There's, now there's a total different level of authority. And he says, hey, I've got a position for you at my company. Come work for me. Wow. Okay. Now this is different. When God comes in, things change dramatically. Different example now. My wife and I were sitting outside of our office one day. This is, uh, this is some years back when we had our offices in North Wilkesboro on 9th Street. Okay, so that's downtown of the city. And there was a festival going on, an apple festival. You know, they, uh, anything to do with apples, you know, uh, bake them and uh, boil them and all kinds of, app, you know, fry them and all kinds of, it's all going on. People all over, uh, that coming by the thousands for the apple festival. And our office was right in the center of that. So Kelly and I went outside and uh, we had one of our workers put up our product table. And we just sat there and we had books available for people and CDs and DVDs of my teaching and, and so forth. And we just sat there and kind of also kind of enjoying, you know, all the activity and all the, the fun Apple stuff. Well, we're sitting there and a lady walks up. And for some reason I saw her. She was an older lady. And she walked up. When she was walking up, she had a book under her arm like she was hugging, like she, you, there was something, she was really attached to that book. And she just, you know, she's just walking up the street. And she's walking up the street and looking around. And she just, uh, uh, you know, kind of meanders over to our table. You know, there's people all in the street and stuff like that. We're sitting on the sidewalk with the street out in front of us. And people by the hundreds are going by. So she just comes over to the table and just kind of just takes a quick look. And she stops all of a sudden. And her eyes got like that big. And she said, oh, she said, you're Stephen Brooks. I said, yes. And she pulled the book out. And it was a book that I wrote. It was the book Working with Angels. She said, I've read your book. I've studied your book. I, I take it with me everywhere I go. I absolutely love your book. And she did. And it greatly blessed her life. Now, but see, what, now watch the shift. She is, she's known the book. This is what a lot of Christians do. They, they know the book. Okay? What's going on now? For the first time, in a very personal way, she's actually meeting the author. And I'm like, yeah, I wrote that book. Everything in that book came out of me. I don't have a ghostwriter. I don't grab stuff and, that others wrote and, and plagiarized. I wrote the whole book. Everything that you're holding that, that blessed you, that all came out of me. So I want to ask you a question. Easy, easy question. I trust that you know the answer. What's greater, the book or the person who wrote the book? Now, please listen and think with me. I'm trying to help some to get from a place of knowing all this stuff. And you do the knowledge. We're not belittling knowledge, the knowledge of the word, the knowledge of scripture. But... Jehoshaphat said, believe in the Lord your God. You're, th that comes to really knowing the person. Pastor Stephen, I know the book. I know people that know the book from the sense they can read it in Hebrew. They can also even read it in Greek. And that's great. And when it comes to translations, we need people with those skills. But when it comes to knowing the person, wow, it's like their personal knowledge of a personal God Somehow, whoop, that, that's something, uh, they're not going to give you that in seminary. They're not going to give you that in, in schools of theology. Wow. Those are things that you're going to have to learn and pick up. Now, yes, you can get around a mentor who does have a deeper walk with God. And if that person knows the person of God, then yes, that's, that's a gold mine. Praise God. But we're going to have to learn this distinctive difference. Praise God. Now, a Christian may say, oh, Pastor Brooks, I love the Bible. You, you may even see him kiss it. Mm -hmm. I, Pastor Stephen, I love the Word. I, I'm not being irreverent, okay? But this is what we're, we're, I'm talking about. They love the Bible. Mm -hmm. They kiss the Bible and hold it to their face. They do these various things. But here's the thing. 
Have you really acquainted yourself with the one who wrote the book, with the author himself? Because there is a difference. There is a difference. Praise God. Mm -mm. Now, what happens if you don't really know the author? And I'm speaking primarily to those that would be in circles that I'm aware of, such as charismatic Pentecostal, or what we would know as spirit-filled Christians around the world, and there's a bunch of us, probably about a billion, then what will happen is that if you start learning the book real good, and you realize all these promises and what belongs to you, but you don't really develop or get acquainted with the author or the person that wrote the book, what will happen is that you'll start trying to grab things. You're like, oh, healing. Oh, yes, healing is mine. Oh, prosperity. Who doesn't want that? Jehovah Jireh. Pastor Stephen, God's name in Hebrew, one of the compound names of God is Jehovah Jireh, and it means he's our provider. Oh, oh. And the next thing you know, they're claiming all kinds of prosperity scriptures and this and that, and they can, they can quote it, and they can spit it out like machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> and it ends up like a free for all grab, grab, take, take. Have you noticed God's too smart for all of that? As if God doesn't know that this is just like people trying to grab and take things without even really in many ways, knowing who he is. Mm -mm. He sees that they only want his blessings and that they're actually not very interested in him. So what happens? He doesn't come on the scene. He doesn't come on the scene. So there's a whole dimension of the faith walk that some Christians are clueless about. Because they know the word. They know the scriptures. They even can have an unveiling of the knowledge. Hey, that rightfully belongs to you. But they've never gone into this other realm of faith where actually God comes on the scene. And to experience that, you have to know him. You're going to have to get acquainted with him. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, that's going to interrupt my golf course time. We got soccer practice around here, Pastor Stephen. How are we supposed to fit all this in? I don't know. But if you ever want God to step in, you need to make some adjustments with your four-point stance. Because trust me, when he walks in, your whole world has changed for good. When he walks in, the sickness is over, over. And it doesn't matter how big and bad it is. It's over. The power of God can instantaneously blast cancer, stroke, heart disease. It can just blast it to smithereens. God can lift it where there is a gradual healing, or God can just come in and you get a rapid miracle. It's up to him. But all I'm saying is the moment he comes in, it's game over for the devil. Mm -mm. And this is the dimension of faith that we must press into. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. John chapter 5. John 5. Hmm. Verse 39, Jesus said to the religious leaders, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Let's read this in the Amplified. Praise the Lord. This is, uh, this is quite illuminating. In the Amplified Version, Jesus said, You search and keep on searching and examining the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And yet it is those very Scriptures that testify about me. And see, they're, they're enraptured with the Word. We are the rabbis. We are the teachers. Yeah, you can teach it backwards and forwards and you know it really well, but you don't know the author. You don't actually know the one who wrote the Scriptures. Moses did. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 46, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. The difference with Moses that is that he knew he was writing about the Lord. <laughs> but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Mm. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Now, let's go back again to the most important position of your stance. You're going to have to have the right stance. And here it is again, verse 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. When you truly believe in God, and it's settled, and you're all in, you'll never be shaken. If everything disappeared, God could bring it right back. 
overnight. The, the enemy came in and devastated everything that Job had. Job never got off the sh God ship. Don't ever abandon God. Stick with God through thick or thin, even if you don't understand it. That was what was going on with Job. He didn't realize this is the devil doing all this to him. But even still, being in a place where he didn't have the illumination of what is actually going on here, he still stayed faithful to the Lord, and God doubled it and gave it all back. Not only gave it back, doubled everything. Mm -mm. Woo, praise God. Why? When you truly believe in God, you finally in your life become established. Now, Pastor Stephen, I'll tell you one thing. If God doesn't come through for me on this one, that's the last he's ever going to see of me. Look, look, if we're going to treat God like this and we're going to act all act like we're eight years old, uh, we really need to get back to basics. <laughs> you're either all in or you're not all in. And you have to get the foundation right from the beginning. Oh, praise God. Here's the thing with God. And I want you to settle this in your heart. I don't know what you need. Maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you need a financial breakthrough. Maybe you need a healing. I, I don't know what you need. But let me say this. Even if you didn't get your healing, even if you didn't get your breakthrough, he's still God and you can never forget that he's still God. We did not vote him in and we cannot vote him out. And when our lives are done on this earth, he's still God. You must decide in your heart. I link up with him and connect with him. He is my God, my only God come hell or high water. I am never leaving him. Now, when that belief is firm, suddenly your life becomes established. Somebody's life is turning right now. You will never know the struggles you've had before. You will never know them ever again. And the Lord is bringing you out and he's delivering you right now because there are some that are watching. You're finally, you're giving it completely to him. Praise God. We see a great example of this in the life of Ruth. Praise God. By the way, I've got a four point stance. I'm just on number one. So I'm going to try to move quickly. Praise God. Uh, Ruth chapter one, we see in verse 14 and 15, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. By the way, everybody knows the story of Ruth. Uh, the book is named after her, but most don't know the other daughter-in-law because she gets quickly forgotten, but her name is Orpah. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. That, of course, would be Naomi. But Ruth clung to her, and she said, look, this is Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. In other words, don't ask me to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, Naomi, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my God, and your God will be, and your God, my God. Let's read the, the uh, continuing part of this phenomenal statement. And Ruth says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. I have an announcement to make to you today that the Orpus who may kiss and show some devotion, the Christian Orpus never ever get God's best for their life. And trust me, God sees right through it. He knows they're not all in. Let me go further. The Orpus never get the Boazes. The Boazes only go to the Ruths. Woo! If you're all in and you're fully committed, that's who God releases his best to. And God, when he sees that you fully believe in him, now suddenly your life becomes established and God will not only bless you in this life, he'll set you up for even a legacy that honors him follows after you. And you know that's what happened with Ruth, who <sighs> through her... Uh, lineage with Boaz, King David came out of that. And also the Christ, Jesus himself, Woo! 
true. It's incredible. But my friends, you're going to be all in. You're going to have to just like, God, I believe you. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. If I lose my job, if I lost everything, God, I'm staying with you forever. <laughs> you ain't never getting rid of me. <laughs> and it's because also of a commitment like that, that you'll never know. Uh, these, um, <clears throat> excuse me, many of these crazy things that people go through, because they're compromising, trying to save their life. And that's why Jesus said, if you're willing uh, to lose your self-life, that's when you find the real life. And also, of course, that's when you come in the true stability. Praise God. All right. The number two point of your four-part stance is that you have to understand that God is willing. Right now, the Father is sitting in heaven, and He's willing to do a miracle. Very willing for you to receive a miracle. He's willing to give it to you. I want you to recognize that God is willing to give you the victory that you're burning within your heart to experience. He's willing to heal your body and give you the major breakthrough that you desire for him to do. Pastor Stephen, are you sure? Yes. Matthew chapter eight, please turn there. Verse one, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him and behold, the leper came and worshiped him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, if the Lord would have said, you know what? I just don't think I want to minister to you. Uh, for whatever reason, you're not, you're just not lined up. Uh, and so, no, but he's, that's not what he did. He said, I'm willing. I'm here to tell you today that God is willing to give you your miracle. In this man's case, it was the cleansing from leprosy. Let me say that whatever would humiliate you or cause you to drop your head in a form of shame is a type of spiritual leprosy that God is willing to remove from your life. And God wants to do such a work in your life that there will not even be a trace of any type of of spiritual leprosy or any trace of how the enemy used to do this or that to you. He'll take it completely away. Understand that God is willing. Praise the Lord. We see this very clearly of what God is willing for you to experience. Third John verse two, beloved, I pray. I, in other words, in the amplified Bible, I desire, I pray, I desire that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Your soul prospering is your walk with God. And out of that comes prosperity includes good success in every area of your life, as well as health in your bodies. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, a beautiful scripture for I know the thoughts. This is God saying, I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Who praise God. What is God saying? God is saying that I want all of your desires fulfilled. I'm willing to help you. Praise the Lord. Number three, understand today in your four-point stance so that you position yourself to see God walk in into your life. Not a representative knocking on the door, talking to you, not even a piece of paper, but God coming in power. I want you to understand number three, that God is able. Jeremiah chapter 32. Let's turn over there. Jeremiah 32 verse 17. The prophet says, ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. I'm telling you today that God is able and God even uh, loved that statement that Jeremiah made and God brings it back in verse 26. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Oh, pastor Steve, my life is complicated. Look, there's nothing so complicated that God can't get in there and smooth it out and fix it and make it the way that it's supposed to be. 
Praise the Lord. This is the same God who furnished a table in the wilderness for several million Israelites. Trust me, he doesn't have any problem uh, putting a meal together for you or making sure that your needs are met. He fed them, millions of them, in a wilderness with no grocery stores, fed them, kept them clothed, kept them uh, nourished in every way. He can take care of your world. Praise the Lord. We also know that Jesus fed 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women, the children. He did this with just a little boy's lunch. And he took that and fed all of those thousands of people. So we need to understand that he did that in the wilderness area. He can get provision to you anywhere, any place, any time. God is not limited. There is nothing that is too hard for the Lord. Woo, praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And then Mark chapter 10, a power scripture for sure. Mark chapter 10, verse 27. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God for with God, all things. Oh, please take a yellow highlighter and take your pen and underline that phrase, all things for with God, all things are possible. And that includes all things includes the miracle that you need for God to do in your life. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God is willing. Yes, God is able, but let's go further. I want you to understand that right now, God is ready to step into your situation and bring it if it's something bad, bring it to a close. If it is something at an impasse, bring it through and to fulfillment. Get ready. Praise God. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14. Praise God. Lord, we give you praise today. You know, we need to understand that, you know, God is as strong as he's ever going to be. It's not like we need to wait for three months because God's working out in the gym. And then when he's strong enough, then he'll come in. No, he's not going to get any stronger tomorrow. Well, Pastor Stephen, perhaps God's love can't yet reach me. No, God's not going to become more loving tomorrow or next year. It's not like that's going to develop or increase. God's love is the same. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So my friends, we must understand he's ready to go when we are ready as well. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. Let's start in verse 30. But when he, Peter, saw the wind, saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Some of you just need to do that. You need to cry out, Lord, Come on into this situation and make this thing right. This is not the way it should be. Woo! And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. You know, Jesus didn't let him go three feet underwater, have all that water, you know, invade his lungs and then pull him up. Peter half dead, you know, lay him over, lay Peter over the side of the boat and push on his back and pump water out of his back and then give him CPR. No, immediately, immediately the Lord caught him, pulled him up. My friends, when the foundation is right, you fully believe in God. And now you begin to unload your faith on your target and you begin to blast the enemy with the spiritual weaponry God has given you. And then you understand God's willing. You understand he's able. He's got the power. And now you understand that God is ready. My friends, what happens? God comes on the scene. And the next thing you know, he did it. He did it. And now we have thus moved from a place where we are espousing scriptures, flinging them around like they're pieces of candy, <laughs> to a place like, we better be careful with this. This is a loaded weapon. This is a living sword. And let us handle the word skillfully and carefully and um, reverently. Look, when you know the Lord, when you truly know him, you, uh, and you know who he is, you cannot be flippant. 
You can, I, I've seen, I saw one preacher one time, took a Bible and just threw it like it was an old junky newspaper, an old worthless magazine, just took it and threw it. And when he did, I was, I was in a youth group when me and the other the teenagers saw it. We, ga <gasps> we gasped because he threw the Bible like it was a worthless piece of nothing. And he said, oh, it's just a book. What was going on? A Bible teacher who knew, who knew knowledge of scriptures but didn't know the author. And that's why it wasn't working for him. That's why his life was completely normal, loaded and weighed down with struggles that he could not conquer or rise above. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for everybody watching right now. I pray that they come into the four-point stance. Some need to make a little bit of an adjustment in that area of fully believing. Because, Father, when we believe, we can't be flippant and believe at the same time. Because we know who you are. We thank you, Father God. Touch your people right now, Father God, with a fresh anointing to go all the way with you. And we thank you that their hope, their expectancy will never, ever be unfulfilled because you have given them a future and a hope, and you're not going to disappoint them. Now, Father, we thank you for coming on the scene. That is the hour of miracles, the hour of manifestations and breakthroughs. Please, everybody watching, lift your hands. Father, I decree and declare that this is the season of breakthroughs over the next three months. You're going to shake the lives of your people, Father God, and do things that it's, it's almost like they could not even imagine such a release of blessing, but yet you're going to do it. Their position is right. Their foundation is concrete. Now, Father, we thank you. They're going to see your goodness. They're going to see your power. The Lord's going to step into the lives of so many that are watching, and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. As you know, he comes on the scene, devils clear back like you wouldn't believe. They clear out of the way. Sickness suddenly, oh, it, I mean, it, it's vaporized in his presence. Mm -mm. Now, Father, we thank you. Seal this word in the hearts of your people in Jesus' name, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're watching today, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never made your peace with God. Do so right now. Pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I want to get my life right with you. Come into my heart. Save me now. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life. And Jesus, step into my life and lead me and guide me from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen. Woo! Welcome. For those of you that just prayed that, welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. My friends, let's take Holy Communion together today. Grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. I use these little portable travel communion sets. Praise God. Grab some grape juice and unleavened bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread, the juice. We consecrate it and bless it. We set it apart as being holy through this prayer. And we thank you that this is the body and the blood of Christ. We thank you, Father, that communion is a kingdom mystery. Because when we look at it, we still see a little wafer in grape juice. But we thank you that we know that this is the flesh and blood of Christ veiled in the form of what would appear to be bread and juice. But Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh today, we thank you for strength. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for coming on the scene. We thank you for faith that works. We celebrate your word and its power. We thank you for the release, O oh God, of your power. Father, we thank you for knowledge. We have to have knowledge. We thank you for revelatory knowledge. Where the scriptures are illuminated, we understand them. But Father, we thank you also for manifestation. As we receive the Lord's body, we thank you for great manifestations, signs, wonders, and miracles that draw people to you through your Son, Christ. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let's receive the Lord's body today. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for vibrant, personal testimonies of your power in our lives. That when others hear it, it just creates a ferocious faith ignition within their hearts. So, Father, yes, we thank you for our blessings and our miracles. But we thank you that we can also inspire others to draw near to you. Because you're ready to bless. And Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise for the miracles you've done. And the miracles that you're doing right now that are unfolding in our lives. Father, may Jesus be glorified greatly. Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ. We ask that if we've committed any sins, you would forgive us. And Father, we forgive anybody, anyone who has sinned against us. We forgive them and bless them and we go on in peace. Now, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us lift our hands and thank the Lord. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. We give you praise and glory and honor. I see the seeds that you have sown out in your field. All the seeds that you've sown, I see them coming alive. Some have been dormant for a while, but I see your seeds coming alive, and I see miracle harvest on the way for you. Be praising the Lord, because He's going to do some things that were even beyond, that are going to even beyond what you're expecting Him to do. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for spending time with me in God's Word. And I look forward to seeing you back next time. Bye-bye.